Okay, good morning. Hi. Uh, welcome. This is actually our 15th Boulder County Senior Law Day. Did the math. So we're at number 15. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Sarah Farrell. I've served on the board of directors for Senior Law Day. This year I co-chaired the planning committee. Um, and so just a little about Senior Law Day. Senior Law Day is an event that is specific to Colorado. I don't know of any other state where these sorts of events take place. But within Colorado, there are various communities all over the state where local volunteers get together and create these events within their community. There's a lot <coughs> of misinformation out there. All of the things we're going to talk about today vary from state to state. So no, talking I guess to I'll your come sister Eileen in California is not a great way to figure out what you're in Colorado. Well, maybe. So there's just a lot of misinformation. You know how it is. You're getting the phone calls, you're getting the scam texts, and all the things. There's a lot Please speak up. Can't hear you. This is the evidence. Yeah, just move up. There's going to be more of us. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get better about projecting where is the air vent. Back here. Over there. So just try to come towards the front if you're having trouble hearing your legs. So, so we do, these, we do these events, we do these senior law day events because we, as lawyers, see folks coming in, we see probates that happen that are really messy and terrible for the families, and we think it's a really great resource for our community members to be able to come in and find out about Colorado law, to maybe do an Ask the Lawyer session if you need that for yourself, and to just, you know, get all these great resources. Um, okay, uh, yes, so we do have a new resource this year. So when you come in the front entrance, there's a room B off to the right, and in that room, we have some community experts who are available to talk about Medicare, to talk about scams and fraud, and to talk about, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, power of attorney issues. Now, none of these folks can give legal advice, uh, but they are Medicare counselors, folks who work at the DA's office. There's someone here from the SEC, the Security, uh, Security and Exchange Commission. So they can um, talk to you one on one if you have something specific to any of those topics. Okay? Uh, so that's in word B up at the front. Uh, please do fill out the uh, evaluations for your presentations you go to and for the event because your feedback is important to us and we do go through it and we make changes to the event every year based on your feedback. And then finally, uh, the Senior Law Handbook. Uh, that will be pulling back out where you registered when you came in. When you leave, the Senior Law Handbook will all be out there so everyone can take one. So please Feel free to take a senior law handbook. Also, a reminder, the Colorado Bar Association on their website has the entire senior law handbook available. So if you know anyone, neighbor, friend, family, who could use that uh, resource, um, it is available online, okay? Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let Carl make a few announcements. Well, good morning once more, and welcome to this year's program. Um, the restrooms are at the end to your left, so it does basic announcement, and um, we'll be having sessions. At the end of the session for Sarah, we'll have questions. So please can you reserve your questions for now, and um, we'll go into the first session now. Before then, let me switch, and then I'll introduce Sarah formally and talk about the program we have for today. Uh, 
So for can you turn off the front light? The light. So we can see the screen better. Thank you. Better. Thank you. <laughs> so for our first session, we'll be talking about estate planning and probate. Or not probate. You just be doing the basics. Basic stuff. Okay? So we want to know how you put your behind together. So that when you are no more or you are sick, the things you care about are taken care of on your behalf. As I said, we'll be doing basics, so not so much. you find out how much it's going to cost you to get it done, um, and what happens if you don't put these documents in place. We'll also cover uh, medical and financial powers of attorney, wills and trusts, probate, estate, and potential pitfalls. Now, to do this, we'll be having Sarah, Farrell, I would just um, welcome everyone to do that for us. Sarah is an estate planner. She's in estate planning and estate administration and elder law attorney. Her firm is located here in Loma. Um, Sarah and her staff, including attorney Landry, assist clients with drafting and using estate planning documents such as power of attorney, wills, trusts, and advanced medical directives, as well as with probate, trust administration, guardianship, conservatorship, and more. Sarah also serves as a professional fiduciary, that's a, a financial agent, trustee, conservator, and then a personal representative. Let's give her just a round of applause as we welcome Sarah to take us through this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Welcome again. So estate planning basics, it's a lot to get through. I'm going to try to speak as clearly as possible and not go too fast. Please, if you do have questions, as Carl said, hold them to the end. I'm going to try and get through the material quickly enough that we can take a few questions, all right? Um, and then I'll be around and there's Ask a Lawyer. There's lots of folks to ask questions today. So. Um, estate planning basics. Let me grab my clicker. Let's see. You know where I need to point it? Do you mind to just stand over there and click the arrow for me when I ask? <laughs> Do it the old fashioned way. Okay. Oh, disclaimer, yes. So our discussion today is for informational use only. Please discuss your personal situation with an expert um, in some other venue. <laughs> uh, I cannot give you specific legal advice today. This is general information. All right, what is an estate plan? An estate plan is different depending on the person, but it's generally speaking a set of documents, a set of plans that you make, okay? So most people are gonna have at least a medical power of attorney, a financial power of attorney, and a will. Those are kind of the basic three that most everyone should have, okay? But there are others as well. But these documents, we create them to make sure that your wishes are known and hopefully honored when you either become ill or incompetent or when you die. So your estate plan ultimately is appointing people who serve as your fiduciaries, as your agent or your trustee or your PR, um, and it's giving them their instructions. That's what your estate plan is. So during your lifetime, the things that, that we use during your lifetime are the financial power of attorney, medical power of attorney, and advanced directives, and trusts also operate during your lifetime. Uh, 
after someone has died, that's when their disposition of last remains declaration, their will, and their trust continues to operate. So your will does nothing during your lifetime. And the important thing to know that a lot of people do not understand, if you are someone's agent, their financial agent, or their medical agent, when that person dies, your authority ends. That document is immediately terminated. So that's really important to understand. So it's very important to have these documents down here ready and in place because your agent has to stop what they're doing when you die. All right, go ahead. So why do I need an estate plan? Honestly, your why is personal to you. You all care about different things. And there really are no wrong answers when it comes to what is important to you. Perhaps you have someone in your family who is disabled and receives lots of benefits and you need to do special needs planning for them. Perhaps you want to make sure that everything is as easy as possible on whoever is going to be doing all of this for you. Or maybe you have really strong feelings about what happens after you die to your body and you want to make sure that those things happen. I've heard all kinds of different reasons why people care what happens. Um, but, uh, you know, it's important to figure that out because that's how we're going to figure out what documents you need and what to put in them, okay? So, if you become very ill, if you want to take care of certain people more than others, if you want to help your loved ones make decisions on your behalf, you need an estate plan. So, on the front of my handout, I have a list of different kinds of tools. So these are the different kinds of documents that might be a part of your estate plan. Okay? They are simply tools. Alright, so financial power of attorney. Like I said, this is one of your lifetime documents. The financial power of attorney only has to do with what's going on while you're alive. So um, basically what you're doing is you are appointing an agent and maybe successor agents and if you need someone to start handling your legal and financial affairs for you, or if you need help, whatever the case may be, those, that person or those people will be authorized to come in and pay your bills, or do your taxes, or deal with your, your income issues, whatever it is that needs to be done. They can do that on your behalf. The important thing I want everyone in this room to hear with a financial power of attorney and a medical power of attorney. If you are the person creating this document, you are not giving up any power at all by having a power of attorney. You are still in charge. As long as you are able to say what you want to happen, what you want is what your agent should be doing. If they are not doing what you want done, while you have capacity, get thee to an attorney and get a new power of attorney and appoint someone else, okay? Because as you're making these documents, it's really important to think about who is going to be the best person for the job. When it comes to your financial power of attorney, you want someone who's good with numbers, good with details, fair, honest, all of those things. And for all of these documents, whoever you appoint, you want somebody who's going to do what you want done right to the best of their ability and to the best of their knowledge but the agent under the financial power of attorney they're going to handle money bills property taxes all of those things during your lifetime now the question you have to ask yourself for all of these documents what happens if i don't have one or what happens if it fails so sometimes these documents fail perhaps you have an agent you might even have a backup but if something happens to those people and they can't do the job once they're needed, well, at that point, that document fails, okay, if you don't have another backup lined up. So if there is no financial power of attorney, if the one that you have fails and you are not in good enough shape to do a new one, then someone will have to go to court and get appointed as your conservator. In Colorado, a court-appointed conservator is the only one who can come in and do this job if there's no financial agent in place. So that's what happens if you don't have this document and need it. Next. Medical power of attorney is a very similar document. 
While the financial agent is handling your finances and your legal things, your medical agent is handling medical decisions and residential decisions. Just like with the financial power of attorney, a medical agent is supposed to do what you want to the best of their ability. Now, sometimes that doesn't work as well as we would like because aging is complicated. We all know that. But that's what this person is supposed to do. And again, so long as you can communicate clearly, so long as we believe that you understand what's going on and that what you are saying actually represents what you want, we're gonna do what you want, okay? But this agent can also be an advocate for you because I will tell you, I've had a lot of medical issues in my lifetime. And there have been times where I sent my medical agent down to the nurse's station to inform them that nurse Susie will never come in my room again. And if she does, I'm gonna start throwing things at her. So please be sure <laughs> to get that message across. Um, because, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's difficult to communicate with our medical providers and we do need somebody to help us advocate for ourselves and this medical agent can do that, all right? But if you do get to a point where you cannot make your own decisions, you cannot communicate your own decisions, you need someone to do that for you. That's what your medical agent is going to do. So this is a very different job than the financial agent, right? If you have someone who is good with medical things, maybe you have someone in your family or a good friend who's a nurse or something like that, if they're willing to do the job, great. Because it's very difficult to make medical decisions for other people these days. It's difficult to make medical decisions for ourselves sometimes these days. There's a lot going on. There's a lot to think about. Um, so that's what your medical agent is going to be doing. And especially, again, if you become incompetent or you're so sick that you can't understand what's going on, you can't communicate what's going on, your medical agent is going to make medical decisions for you. Now, if there is no power of attorney, this is an unpredictable situation. Colorado law basically says, whoever shows up to the hospital gets a say. So if you've got a nosy neighbor who cares about you very much, or you have a sibling who believes that they are the matriarch of the family and they run everything, and that's not who you want to be making your medical decisions, please, please, please get your medical power of attorney drafted. The other thing that could happen, similarly to the financial power of attorney, if there's no power of attorney or again, if it fails for some reason, uh, somebody may have to go get appointed as guardian by the court. And the thing with the court appointments, it's not the end of the world, but they're expensive. It's always a little stressful going through it because it's, you know, it's a difficult process. You have to go in and ask a judge to take away somebody's legal rights and appoint someone else. There's a lot of stuff they have to prove. There's a lot of service requirements. The nice thing about conservatorships and guardianships is they are um, supervised by the court. They have to submit plans. They have to submit reports every year so that the judge can see what's going on. So if there's a problem, uh, you know, the judge is going to step in and and have a conversation or maybe appoint someone else. But um, there, that is the upside to the court appointments. The other time where court appointments are good, um, and hope, I'm sure this is never gonna be any of you, but occasionally we have a loved one who becomes combative, maybe they have dementia, they're making a lot of questionable or objectively terrible decisions. Well, with the power of attorney, they're still in charge. They can do what, you can't stop them. There's no way to stop someone giving their money away or spending it on things they don't need with the power of attorney. So sometimes we have clients who find themselves in a situation where they cannot get their person to understand what's going on. They cannot get them to stop giving away money or answering phones to scammers <laughs> and these kinds of things. And in those situations, sometimes we will go get a conservatorship um, simply to be able to shut down and secure those finances. Um, so that's another uh, reason that conservatorships can actually be uh, very helpful. Next. 
All right, advanced medical directives. We've got different kinds in Colorado. These are all different from state to state. You can do a living will with an attorney. That is a very limited document. It just has to do with uh, whether or not you want uh, artificial nutrition and hydration and other means, which is basically respirators and other things keeping you alive, okay? That's really all that document does. You can do with your physician uh, or on your own a CPR directive. I also am a huge fan of uh, the most form, uh, which is something your doctor does. Uh, it's called medical order for scope of treatment, and it actually covers several things. And your doctor fills it out, and you both talk about it, and you sign it, and it goes into your medical file, and it's actually a physician's order, so it has to be followed in any medical setting. Okay, and then you get a copy that you can put on your fridge, and it's this crazy bright green piece of paper. It's very hard to miss. Um, so first responders will see it. This is actually incorrect. <laughs> I missed updating this from my last presentation. Uh, but Kurt Hofgard is presenting at 11 o'clock about medical directives uh, and, and other sorts of things like that. Um, so definitely, if you want to know more about medical, uh, 11 o'clock, Kurt Hofgard is presenting. Okay, disposition of last remains. I personally like this document. Now, I will tell you, if you have the means to go ahead and pre-plan and pre-pay for whatever it is that you want done prior to your death, please do. That is one of the greatest gifts that you can give to your family and your loved ones. Because when someone has died, you know, usually it's stressful, sad, it may be shocking depending on what happened, and you know, if that's all taken care of, that is a huge load lifted on whoever's handling your affairs at that point. But if it's not already planned and prepaid, this document allows you to say what wishes you do have, or if you don't have anything in particular that you care about, you can appoint someone and say who will make the decisions. Um, if you have prepaid, Definitely make sure people know so that they don't go and pay again. Um, and again, if you don't have this document, Colorado law determines who has priority. So it's a list, and it's the list you would expect. If there's a spouse, the spouse has priority. If there's no spouse and there are children, the children have priority. But if there are no instructions, this is how people get into arguments, right? So it's really nice to let people know what you want or to say this is who's making the decision. Um, something else I was going to say about that. Oh, this is also a really good document if you care very much about what you want done and you think someone may not listen to you. Funeral homes and mortuaries are supposed to follow this document. So for example, if you are of a certain uh, religious affiliation, and you want to be cremated, and typically that is not allowed. Um, this is a way that you can sort of force the issue and say, nope, this is what we're doing. I've also used this to uh, restrict um, autopsies. Some people, for religious reasons, they do not want an autopsy under any, under any circumstances. Um, so there are things that we can do for those kinds of things. The other thing is, if you would like your body donated, to medicine or to science or something like that. That is something that has to be done in advance. So if that's something you're interested in, you need to figure out where you want to go. They'll have their own paperwork, their own process. You need to get all that filled out in advance and get the information for what happens. Because usually that, that process has to happen very quickly. As soon as you die, that organization needs to be contacted so that they can get your body where it needs to go and, and have it preserved the way it needs to be preserved for whatever purposes you're going for. All right, will. Everybody worries about a will. Everyone comes to me and says, oh, I need a will. Okay, yeah, you should have a will. Your will is going to say who's in charge and who does all the things. So in Colorado, we call that person a personal representative or a PR. Other states call them executors. You may have heard that word too. You can also do a lot of things with a will. You can direct a, cr a trust to be created after your death. You can direct a trust to be created after your death only if it's needed. 
Um, you can name guardians for minor children. Um, obviously, you can direct how your assets are going to be distributed. Um, if you do not have a will, Colorado has a set of laws that will determine who has priority to serve. It's kind of like all the other stuff, spouse first, children, it's, it's the list you would assume, right, um, that we would have in place. And then there's a, there are a set of rules for what happens to your stuff. Now, if you have family, your property is not going to go to the state. It's going to go to your family, okay? So now who it goes to depends on your family, right? Now I can tell you, I worry a lot less about folks with a truly traditional family situation. So if you have a spouse and you and your spouse had all of your children together, and, and if you want everything to either go to your spouse or if they've already passed, you want everything to go to your children equally, that's what's going to happen under Colorado law, right? But it gets a lot trickier if you have children from other relationships, if your spouse has children from other relationships, that's where things start to get dicey. And in those situations, you do need a will because those children are entitled to a part of their parents' estate, okay? So you need to make sure that you have your ducks in a row in those situations. So if you have any sort of non-traditional life style or family situation, your will probably is more important, okay? Um, but I will tell you, honestly, I worry a lot more about people having a medical power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. Because for most of us, at some point in our lives, we do need someone to step in and make some of those decisions. And if we don't have those documents, it's going to be a mess. Um, this is important too. Uh, but like I said, if you have a truly traditional family, I honestly don't really care if you have a will <laughs> as much as the powers of attorney. Those are more important. Okay? That's nice. Trusts. All right. Trusts. Trusts are very complicated. Lots of people will tell you that you must have a trust. Okay? Um, there are lots of different kinds of trusts. You can do lots and lots of different things with trusts, but they may not actually do what you think, okay? So a lot of people sell trusts. That's what they do for a living, and they tell you all kinds of scary stories about why you need trusts, all right? I will tell you, in Colorado, avoiding probate is not a good enough reason to have a trust. Probate in Colorado is a very simple process it's a very inexpensive process. If you do not use a lawyer to help you with probate, the most expensive thing you will do is open probate with the court at about $230. That is the, the most expensive piece of it. The second most expensive piece of it is running the creditor's notice in the newspaper, which just depends on where you are and how much the new newspaper charges, okay? So those are the two most expensive pieces of probate in Colorado. There are instructions on the court's websites, and the court has its own sets of forms. So anyone who feels comfortable enough doing probate can do it all on their own without a lawyer. There are instructions, there are forms. Take a look at it. See if it's something that you think you can figure out. If you, if you think it's too much for you, go and hire an attorney. We'll e-file everything for you. We'll never go to court unless there's a problem, okay? In Colorado, you cannot close probate until six months has passed. But once everything is done and six months has passed, you can do it unsupervised, like I said, which means we're never gonna go in and talk to the judge unless there's a problem, okay? So in Colorado, it was a very, very simple process. And probate is not something to avoid just for the sake of avoiding it. And in fact, I will tell you, it's harder to fight a trust in Colorado, if a trustee goes rogue and isn't doing their job or they're doing things they shouldn't be doing, it's much harder to get them involved. If, it, if it's a probate situation and the PR is mishandling things, the judge will get involved and find out what's going on because the court appointed that person. <laughs> so they're responsible, right? So it's actually a lot easier to make sure it goes well when we're in probate court, okay? now. But I will say trusts are good for a lot of things, so I'm not 
dumping on trust, it's a tool, right? So sometimes we need a hammer and sometimes we need a chainsaw. All right, so trusts are good for people who own out-of-state property. If you own property in California, New York, Louisiana, basically anywhere on any coast, you probably need a trust. <laughs> if you have any kind of real estate interest in any other state, a trust will make it easier to handle that property. Okay? But some of those states do have terrible, terrible probates. And when we have out-of-state property, it has to be real estate or mineral interest or some sort of real estate related interest. But if you have anything in another state, you do have to open an ancillary probate in that state to handle that, that property interest, okay? <laughs> so trusts are good for that. Trusts are fantastic when you've got a blended family situation. You've remarried, you both have kids from previous relationships. You wanna make sure that your spouse is taken care of for their lifetime, but then you wanna make sure that whatever's left, some of it gets to your kids, some of it gets to their kids. A trust is great for that, right? Um, trusts are fantastic for complex tax planning if you're rich enough to care about that. I'm not. I don't know anyone who is, frankly. But I know those people are out there. Um, and then leaving property to people who receive disability benefits. There are special trusts called special needs trusts or supplemental needs trusts. We draft a lot of those. So if you have someone in your life who is disabled, who receives Medicaid benefits, Social Security disability benefits, whatever it is that they receive, there's a way to get money to them without those being counted assets. If they're counted assets, they'll lose those benefits if they inherit money. And that's a huge mess for them. It's not worth it, especially if we're talking like $10,000, not worth it. You wanna leave them $3 million? Okay, maybe. But <laughs> um, you know, it's not worth it to lose their disability benefits over an inheritance most of the time. So in those cases, those trusts are incredibly useful tools. And I'll tell you, if you're thinking about it, you're on the fence, should I do a special needs trust for my daughter, granddaughter, son, brother? Um, the thing that's fantastic about a third party special needs trust, if someone will create it, you can design it so anyone can put money in. So if someone will go ahead and get that trust created now, during your lifetime, Anyone in the family, so long as they know the name of the trust, anybody can leave money to that trust. So it's a really great tool. There's lots of really good tools for special needs planning. So if you have someone in your life like that, definitely look into your options. All right. So those are the tools. Um, a lot of people are very concerned about death taxes. Death taxes is a very scary phrase. The current threshold is $13.61 million per person. So. If you, as a single person, have more than $13 million worth of assets, you have a taxable estate. If you are married, you and your spouse will need to own more than $27 million to have a taxable estate. Like I said, that's not me, that's not anyone I know. Um, now, you will have to continue to pay income taxes, perhaps. There will probably be a final income tax return after your death, but for most of us, <coughs> Death taxes are not an issue, and Colorado just mirrors the feds. So if you don't owe any federal estate taxes, you will not owe any Colorado estate taxes. Now that is not true elsewhere. So if you move out of Colorado, you wanna find out what your state does, okay? <coughs> um, all right, so I like to talk about how property passes because this is something that is very confusing to a lot of people. Uh, you have this on the back of your handout, this table. There are three things that happen when we die. Well, three things that can happen when we die. The first is, some things will pass by title or by property law. So, for uh, married couples, usually everything passes in these first two columns. Often we own our house together as joint tenants. We might own our vehicles together as joint tenants. Anything that we own together as joint tenants, the full phrase is joint tenants with rights of survivorship. But what that means is whoever survives gets the thing, okay? So anything that you own in joint tenancy, if your co-owner dies, 
you are taking the death certificate to the appropriate organization and handing them the death certificate and maybe filling out a form, they take the, the other person's name off and now it's just in your name. It's that simple, okay? Now you do need to make sure you own things the way you think you do. So for example, with real estate, there has to be magic language in the title. It has to say that you own it as joint tenants, very specifically. If it does not have the magic language, you do not own it as joint tenants, you own it as co-tenants, which means you own it 50-50. And I see this a lot. This gets screwed up a lot when people uh, buy property. And sometimes, I just did this recently for a client, um, they did not have this, the magic language in the title when they bought the property. And her husband died years ago, and we were doing her estate planning. We took a look at the deed, and I, I was like, okay, well, you can wait and make your kids do it later when you die, or we can go ahead and clean it up now. So we opened probate with the sole purpose of drafting and recording a deed to get his 50% of the property to his wife. Um, so that happens. So it's very important to make sure that you own all of these things the way you think. If you think you own as joint tenants and spouses, double check that, okay? Is it possible to get a copy of that? It's on there. It's right here on the bottom of page two. Oh, I didn't get the paper. Okay, we'll get you one. Um, so that's, that's column one. Column two is by contract, okay? So retirement accounts, life insurance, even bank accounts, stocks, all different kinds of things. Technically, you can set those up to pass by contract law. So if you have a beneficiary designation form, and you have filled that out with the organization that holds that asset for you, you just created, created a contract. And what that form says is, if you fill out our, con our form, if you fill out our form, when you die, we're gonna do what that, that form says, okay? We have a contract, all right? So a lot of those things pass that way, lots. Also, trusts are also basically considered contracts. So if there's a trust, Everything's going through the trust, all right? Now, you'll see probate's way down there. So the only stuff that goes in column three, that goes in probate, is anything that's not in the first two columns. So often when we have spouses and one spouse dies, we don't open probate, because everything passes by one of these first two columns, okay? Um, but if you have anything that's only in your name, uh, when you die, we may have to open probate. It depends on what it is. If it's real estate, we have to open probate. We always have to open probate if there's real estate and if there's no other thing happening to move to real estate. But uh, we also, in Colorado, have what's called a small estate affidavit. I think the threshold right now is around $90,000. If a person dies, they have no real estate and everything they own adds up to less than $90,000, you still don't have to open probate. There's a form we use called a small estate affidavit, and we use that instead to do all the things we need to do to administer the estate, okay? So those are the three ways that things pass. If you have questions about this, happy to talk to you some other time um, if this isn't clear, okay? But it's very important, again, in these first two columns, make sure everything is set up the way you think it is because Whatever is set up, that's what's going to happen. It doesn't matter what you put in your will. If you have a contract, if you have joint tenancy set up, that's what's happening, okay? So if it's wrong, whatever is on it, that's what's happening, okay? So for example, um, say you've got your kids on your life insurance policy. One of them has become disabled and you realize, oh, they really shouldn't get that money because they'll lose all their benefits. Well, if you never get around to updating it, when you die, that kid is gonna get their share of that life insurance policy, okay? So, it doesn't mean they'll necessarily lose their benefits, but they may have to put that money into what is a first person special needs trust, and that's a whole other ball of wax. But, um, you know, it's just, it gets complicated. So make sure these things are correct you can go get copies from the organizations if you don't know what are on these forms, go ask. You've got a life insurance agency, you can 
page on there, if you've got somebody that you can go and say, hey, I need a copy. What are your thoughts on the payable on death bank accounts and CD? We'll get there. Uh, <laughs> all right, what's next? We're, we're nearly there. Pitfalls. All right. <laughs> Let's talk for a moment about pitfalls. Do it yourself. We live in a do it yourself age, right? We can go to YouTube, we're watching HGTV, we're, you know, we're doing all the things ourselves these days, all right? Um, you're welcome to try and do this yourself. You know, a lot of people are like, well, something's better than nothing. Well, honestly, not always. I can tell you the worst probate cases I have seen uh, are the cases where somebody did it themselves, they used language they didn't really understand, they thought it meant one thing, it meant something else, or they didn't think it through and they did something that just didn't make a ton of sense. Uh, and the problem is, once you're dead, we can't ask you what you meant, and we can't change the plan easily, right? So, for example, uh, I had a gentleman who left his house to his wife and her daughter. And, you know, her daughter was a minor, and, you know, it's kind of like, well, did he really want that? He really wanted the daughter to own the house with her mother? Um, you know, so that was a, a thing we had to unravel. It was really stressful for mom, because um, obviously she didn't want to, like, do something for her child that would hurt her child, but she was also pretty sure that's not what he meant. And it wasn't my wife or her child if something has happened to my wife. It was my wife and her child. So it was literally going to both of them. Um, and there, there have been a lot of cases like that where a probate comes in and, you know, we just, we don't understand what they meant or what they said just is not really great. And it, it, we fix it, but, you know, it costs more, it's more complicated. If everybody's not on board, it can turn into litigation. Okay, I'll just put my kids on everything. I'm going to avoid probate. I'm going to put my kids on everything. In Colorado, and if you don't believe me, go talk to somebody in the gay's office. Only actual owners should own an asset. Okay? Please, please, please do not ever add your kids to your house, your financial accounts, or anything else as an owner. Okay? You can use a pay on death designation if you want it to go straight to them for some reason. You can get a financial power of attorney created so that they can manage your things for you. If you add them as an owner, they own that thing. If they get divorced, that's a marital asset in the divorce proceeding. If they become an addict and steal your stuff, it's not stealing, they owned it. It's gone, there's nothing you can do. Okay. I had a case like that a few years ago. Uh, mom and dad had put a daughter on an account, and she did. She stole all kinds of money from them. And, and the bank was concerned, and we sent everything over to the, to the detectives at Longmont PD, who are fa fantastic with this stuff. And they were like, sorry, but she's on as an owner. She, she's a joint owner on the account. There's nothing we can do. Very sad. Now, I pulled, a credit I pulled dad's credit report and found $50,000 worth of credit cards that were going to her house. Um, so I sent that off to the detectives, and they were able to use that to get a conviction. But you know, a lot of folks don't want to convict their own kids of theft. Um, but you know, these things cause all kinds of problems. If you need Medicaid for long-term care, you know, and assets have been going where they shouldn't be going, you're not going to quali qualify for Medicaid, right? You're going to have penalties. Like, it causes all kinds of problems. So please, 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 do not put anyone on as an owner. All right, next slide. Tips. All right, we talked about choosing the right person for the job. So again, with PRs, trustees, financial agents, anybody handling money, somebody who's detail-oriented, good with numbers, takes care of stuff, someone who's fair and honest, okay? Even if they don't like their sibling, they're gonna give them their share, right? Um, Choose people who are going to honor your wishes and follow the rules, okay? Something I tell a lot of my clients, if you do not want to be on life support and you have a very devout Catholic sister, maybe don't, be the, don't make her your medical agent and tell her to pull the plug. That might be hard on her. Find, find the person in your family who understands and is okay with being in that position, okay? Hire an expert if you can, an attorney, financial planner, We've got lots of folks out there who help with these things, okay? Um, people do ask, you know, how much does this cost? Unfortunately, 
you can call 10 different attorneys and you're going to get 10 different prices. Okay? So I encourage folks to shop around. Most of us do flat fees. So for example, the way we do this is we have a questionnaire, we do a free consultation, we talk to you, we look at your information, we decide what, what you need for a plan, what you want for a plan, and we tell you a flat fee. And that's how much it costs, okay? So then you can make a decision whether or not you want to move forward. Different attorneys do it different ways, but most estate planning attorneys are doing flat fees, okay? Um, communicate, avoid surprises, and prepare people. My grandfather told no one anything. <laughs> Nobody knew anything. He died. My aunt took over the estate. She didn't know what was there. She didn't know what was in the will. She did her best. It was fine. But, you know, nobody knew anything. Um, these days, I highly recommend, especially if you have, like, multiple children, at some point, sit them all down at the same time if you can. Get them on Zoom or something if you have to. And just tell them what's going to happen so they know. They may not like it, but they'll have time to get over it, hopefully. And if they don't, they were never going to get over it. But at least everybody knows, and everybody heard the same thing. Okay? And nobody's being surprised to find out, what do you mean mom didn't make me her medical agent? Like, I'm a nurse, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Uh, but that gives you, a, you know, an opportunity to explain what you care about what matters to you, why you're doing things the way you're doing it. Um, and I think, honestly, that can prevent so many problems later. So please, please, please try to prepare. Consider access and logistics, okay? Whoever's doing this stuff for you, how do they get into your house if there's an emergency? How do they get onto your computer or your phone? How do they know what accounts you have? Does anything come in the mail anymore? No. For most of us, it does not. So this stuff, you've got to kind of organize and prepare, okay? And you've got to think about how people are going to do this. Okay, so real quick, back to pay on debt. Um, the thing you have to think about, this is why it's so important to have a good estate plan. Really think about the full picture. Sometimes, if all you have, if you have no real estate, for example, all you have are bank accounts, you can just do pay on death designations and just do it that way if it's simple enough, right? Now they might fail, right, if people die before you and you don't get those things updated. Personally, I like just using a will because it covers all the contingencies, okay? A good will will cover all the contingencies. So if somebody predeceases you, there's a plan B. If somebody's disabled, there's a plan for that, okay? Right. When you do pay on death designations, there's not always a plan B or a plan C. Things can fail, um, but it's a tool, and it might make sense for you, okay? But if, for example, you have a house, you probably want some of your money to go into your estate to pay bills, and you know anything that needs to happen as part of your estate, otherwise you're, whoever's handling your affairs, your kids, or whoever it is, they're gonna have to front money for you, right? They're gonna have to pay the utility bills, to keep the electric on and all that kind of thing. So sometimes pay on death doesn't make sense to me. So it really just depends on your situation. So I've only got a minute for questions, but does anybody have a question at this point? Yes, sir. In regards to Medicaid uh -huh. and possible placement in a, a long-term facility, Yes. can you, is someone going to talk about a Miller Trust? Um, so, Medicaid and for long-term care in a facility. John Estes is doing a presentation in this room. I can't remember if it's at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, John Estes will be in this room talking about Medicaid planning. I'm sure he will cover Miller Trusts as part of that presentation. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned six months have passed probate. Can you please explain that a little further? Yeah, six months. It's actually really simple. There's a law in Colorado that says Estates have to be open at least six months. You can't close it until six months has passed. And that's okay. You know, you're going to open the estate. The creditor's period is four months. <laughs> so you're not going to do anything until all the creditor's claims come in. So six months is about as fast as we can do it anyway. And some, some probates are just going to be longer. But really complicated ones are going to take a really long time. If you leave a mess, your probate could be open for years. I have one where there's a mess down in 
Archuleta County with this land and all these people in the family have owned pieces of the land and titles murky and nobody knows who owns what. And so my client, the PR, who by the way is not getting anything, everything's going to a charity, but she is stuck with the unhappy task of having somebody survey it and potentially having to do a quiet title action. And this probate has been open for four years so far. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. The, the person you named as your executor, do they need to live in the same state? They do not. Okay. It's a it's a beautiful age that we live in. I actually go back and forth between Colorado and Indiana. I flew on, in on Wednesday. I'm flying right back out this evening. Okay. <laughs> and so most of what I do, I can do uh, in Indiana. My I have a little boy. My parents are there. They're aging. I'm a very busy person. I'm lucky to have a great staff here in town. So I have people here who can handle things on the ground if, you know, it's so urgent that, you know, I can't get out here fast enough. But most of what I do, I can do from anywhere. I have worked. I've worked from South Africa. I've worked from Germany. I've worked from the UK. So, you know, especially for the financial stuff, these days, like, they may have to come out after you die if they're doing an estate, right? Because that can get complicated. But even for the medical stuff, the doctors, the hospitals, they really just need to know who do we talk to and how do we get a hold of them, right? So they're happy to get somebody on the phone and just say, hey, here's what's going on, here are our options, what do you want us to do? So, you know, and again, if you've got good documents, if you're going to an attorney and getting it done right, like we always um, advise our clients to include delegation powers so that your agent can delegate. So if they do need help, they can just delegate to somebody instead of having to resign because they can't do it in person. So if, um, if out-of-state assets are included, is there some special uh, credential for, for selecting an attorney for handling that? No. Or is it pretty much an estate attorney? If yeah, there are trusts still, and yeah, out of state anybody assets. Anybody who does probate, just get a probate attorney, but they'll have to probably hire an attorney in that state to help with the ancillary probate. Because when it comes to real estate, it's a whole state to state. I, I mean, in advance, prior to no, uh, not death, is no. there? You know, attorneys die, they retire. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I know. That happened. <laughs> in the back, ma'am. So, what happens with a safe deposit box? Safe deposit box, yes. Planning for logistics. Think what that one through. You have to have a, a signer usually with a key, okay, to be able to get in your safe deposit box. And that's why I tell people, think about access. Where are you keeping your documents? If they're in a safe deposit box and nobody else can get to that box, nobody's got access to your documents. There is a statute that forces after your death, the bank has to open it, but um, that can take a while. So, you know, I typically tell people with your originals, you know, don't hide them. Don't put them in a Ziploc in the back of the freezer. Don't bury them in the backyard. Like, put them in a safe from Walmart for $25. You know, those fireproof safes. Um, and let people know where they are. And if you've got a safe deposit box, you're going to have to bring somebody, have them at it as an agent, not an owner, and make sure they know where a key is and that they'll be able to get to the safe deposit box. Otherwise, they have to use the statute to get access and they actually drill in and destroy the box and it costs money. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not great, but you can have someone add it as an agent and have them on the signing card. And as long as they have a key, they can show up and get it. So my mom did all this stuff back in the 90s yep. in California. Uh -huh. Did that document, those documents going to be good here? Um, here, probably. We do what we can now. state to state, right? So if someone comes in from out of state, we do our best to honor their documents and use their documents. The best thing you can do is ask someone to take a look at them. Um, we do that often. Uh, we will do like a one-hour paid consultation. We'll look at the documents in advance and we'll let you know like whether we think anything needs changed, nothing, everything. You know, with the passage of time, often something needs changed, but it just depends. Okay. All right, we've got to call it because it's five till. I uh, want you to be able to get to your next things and you know, run where you need to go, and I need to get to ask a lawyer. But thank you very much for coming. I hope you all have a great day and with lots of good information. Okay.
very much for taking us through this session. Um, I have learned a lot, and I guess this is going to be very interesting. Yes, you have also learned a lot. Um, as we go to the next session, I'll be handing over these, so kindly grab one so you can really clip on So I'll be at the end.